Our conversation today is about the relevance of agents, but many of the agents you'll be hearing about in the coming months are attempting to tackle a very hard computer science problem. They're trying to solve an open-ended planning and reasoning problem to navigate a relatively open world. Salesforce and some other enterprise vendors have a unique opportunity because their customers have a map of the state of the customer facing, customer facing portion of their business in the form of applications and a data cloud. They have the equivalent of what researchers call a world model. That world model converts that open-ended planning and reasoning problem into a much simpler search problem. Customers can create an agent, give it a task and tools in the form of a library of workflows, and it can navigate its way to accomplishing the objective. Today, we're gonna to talk about how Salesforce is starting to bring this vision to life. We're with Vijay Pandyarajan, who's VP of Product Management for MuleSoft, and the occasion is the introduction of some of the first technology Salesforce is introducing to help developers build agents. Vijay, tell us about your role and what Salesforce is introducing at its event on June 25th. Yeah, hey, George, and hey, everyone. Um, really excited to be here to talk about some of the cool things we're building out. Uh, cool and impactful, I would say. Um, we have um, this notion of autonomous agents and how they're going to help simplify work for various creators and various business users in the enterprise. Uh, in particular, we're going to be talking about um, AI-powered customer experiences at our conference next week, uh, which I think will be super relevant to the many customers that are going to join us. Um, my role at MuleSoft is uh, to think ahead, uh, to think about the problems that uh, customers have faced, the enduring problems, and some maybe newer problems, and then being able to take uh, the evolution of technology, especially with the AI technologies that we've had here, and bring them to bear in our automation and integration spaces. Uh, there's a lot of uh, new ground to be plowed and new ways to solve uh, enduring problems. Okay, so we've seen a ton of hype around Gen AI. We've seen co-pilots and assistants, basically where it's almost like a, a request response pattern of interaction. Um, and it seems within that broad um, category of where the state of technology is, that the, there's two initial killer apps. One is software development, the other is customer service. Um, and it's clear within the context of actually each of those that the next wave of Gen AI is, is agents. So elaborate on the definition of agents that developers will be able to create within the context of these um, tools that Salesforce is introducing. Yeah, I mean, think about the 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 job of any creator. I think developers are the best personification of it, but really there are other creators and builders in your organization as well. Uh, people whose job it is to put together uh, interesting and useful applications uh, that help end users get their jobs done, right? And, uh, and in this realm, uh, a lot of the work ends up being you could say at the end coding work, uh, and then there's a lot of conceptual work. And usually the conceptual work, you might call these people architects, or you might call them, you know, this is the best way to, to build this so it's scalable and it's secure and it fits within the system. And what we're gonna see is that more of the hands-on day-to-day coding is gonna be delegated over to agents themselves. And the intent-based uh, aspects of it uh, of what the developer's journey uh, is going to get further emphasized, right? So you're going to be doing more conceptual thinking and supervision, and then the day-to-day -day coding tasks are going to be handled by these agents. And we've sort of seen this happen over the last 18 months with Gen AI and uh, you know the various LLM opportunities that people have had. Uh, every developer I know now has a subscription and is doing uh, is almost sort of doing this on their own in a handcrafted kind of way. Um, we'd love to bring that directly into the tools that people are working in every day. So you're not sort of handcrafting this, right? So uh, really a bigger emphasis on intent uh, and, you know, more of the 
cookbook pieces of, uh, you know, here's a snippet to solve this particular problem. It's just going to be delegated down to a particular agent. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Okay, so let's make this concrete. Um, let's talk about um, a use case that a customer might relate to where you've got um, individual specialist agents that might relieve um, a customer working in Salesforce from the tedium of individual tasks and maybe an example where several of these are working together under the supervision of a user or a user's own agent. Yeah, um, you know, think of think of a you know you're a, let's pick a retail scenario or you're a logistics manager or supply chain manager at a at a company. Um, you, you know, you've got many things going on through the year. You're always sort of planning ahead to some extent, and then as that particular season approaches, you're making fine tune you're fine tuning. Uh, you know, your stocking and your allocation and sort of the approach that you're taking. Um, so there's both a planning aspect and an execution aspect in the supply chain world. Uh, and sometimes these two actually kind of collide and you have to make changes, right? Like not everything goes the way you're expecting it to. Uh, so think about a supply chain manager um, being supported by, you know, let's call it a chief of staff agent because uh, this agent really is um, helping the supply chain manager with a variety of tasks. Uh, obviously, this chief of staff agent is not going to know everything, and that's where sort of a trusted network of specialized agents uh, come in. So, if you were to think of a scenario where you know you, you're expecting an unseasonable, you're not expecting an unseasonable uh, heat wave, right? Like what we're sort of experiencing right now, um, and you've made your product allocations in a particular way, and certain consignment of uh, products to be delivered to certain stores. Uh, your chief of staff agent is happily keeping up with some of these uh, anomalies and is alerting you to say, look, I mean, in about a month uh, or so, we're expecting unseasonable uh, temperatures in these certain places. And you may want to take uh, some action to make changes to the allocation of goods to these places. Um, and not just that, um, I'm going to go pull up a plan for you to, to review and take action on. Um, and so they might, this chief of staff agent might look to some other specialized agents uh, to say which stores are going to be, you know, in this affected heat wave uh, area, what kind of, uh, you know, what subset of products are actually going to change because of this heat wave. Maybe it's sunscreen and it's, uh, um, it's sunshades and things of that nature. So there's going to be a subset of product allocations that, uh, you know, this, uh, this agent has to look at. Um, and, and so that becomes a little bit of the fulfillment agent starts coming into play to say, uh, this, is, this is what we were going to send the store, but maybe we should be redistributing that. Um, and then from there on, this chief of staff agent is likely looking at a, at a supplier agent as well to say, okay, who is the supplier that's actually supplying us these pieces? Could they supply us more of this, or should they be, you know, rerouting their shipments? We're buying the same overall amount, but should they be rerouting some of those shipments to a different place? So, you know, right here you saw, you know, several specialized agents come into play. Right, there's a, um, there's the inventory agent that came in, there's the store agent that came in, there's a fulfillment agent that came in, and even a supplier agent that came in, uh, all sort of working in concert with this chief of staff agent. Um, the ultimate goal of this is to provide a plan or provide a, uh, a, a couple of options potentially to the supply chain manager to say, which way would you like to go, right? And, um, and it could very well be that there are cases where you might have to pay more to acquire these things. Uh, and that might be, or you might have to bring on an additional supplier. So there's uh, different variations on this, but at the end, the, the point is the supply chain manager has a, a lot of help in assessing uh, end goals. And it's really because of this interconnection of these independent but verified agents uh, that are being pulled together by this chief of staff agent, if you will. Okay, so to be clear, each agent has a specific set of workflows or tools that it's program programmed to use, and it generates essentially its own workflow as to how to sequence um, and compose these other workflows to accomplish their specific tasks. So one might be, can this supplier increase my allocation of a certain product? Another one 
Another agent would be, can my logistics providers move this allocation? Um, and so some there must be some mechanism for the agents to coordinate. I don't know if that means there's a distributed consensus going on where they're negotiating on different plans that the individual agents come up with. Is there some sort of um, coordination mechanism? Yeah, I mean, there's one, just the discoverability to find these agents themselves, right? So the chief of okay. staff agent has a palette of these uh, specialized agents to go to. Um, there's there's some, uh, typically when you're looking at fulfillment, there are, there's different things you can optimize for. You know, you could be optimizing for shipping costs at the beginning of the month. And then, um, you know, actually at the end of the month, you're like trying to say, okay, we're within our exceeding our shipping cost budget. So we got to watch out for that. But at the beginning of the month, you might just be looking at customers, uh, customer satisfaction. And so, yeah, there are some policies in place in which you can sort of dial the knob on which way you should go. Uh, in this case, clearly, this is about a customer sat and making sure that you don't run out of things at the at the particular store. So while the plans are being put together, there are some uh, there are some constraints on the fulfillment side uh, that will uh, that will help hew the uh, the recommendations in the direction that uh, the supply chain manager wants. Okay, and and we're going to get into unpacking this, but to be clear, it means the actions of and the outcomes of one agent can be constrained by the capabilities of, or the, the constraints in the policy built into other agents. Yeah, exactly. I think that there there's, there are, there are both operational policies that the agents can work off of. Uh, uh, it's not unlike an API today, right? Like you have API policy management that's in there. This is a very similar uh, notion. Um, and, and ultimately these agents are exposed as, uh, as APIs to be called and managed, uh, cataloged and discovered. Oh, okay. So you, the, the constraints and the goals become policy that you would have applied to an API. They just generate their own workflows with respect to those policies. Yeah, there you go. And and what the what the answers, what kind of answers you might get back, right? And. Uh, and this is also iterative. That's the other thing, right? Like you make a, it, it comes back with a plan and then you can, notionally, you should be able to change that uh, depending on uh, what your desired thing is at that moment. You might see, you might have other constraints that uh, that have to be applied further. And just to be clear, um, up front, when someone is building each of the specialist agents, do the equivalent of inputs and outputs have to be strongly typed and matched to the other agents that will be, you know, feeding them and consuming their outputs. Uh, yeah, typically you want to have some standard ways in which you're transacting between your agents, right? And that's the way you can actually understand uh, what each agent is coming back with and what the uh, what the what the next agent is going to interpret um, and and take forward. Uh, certainly, being able to, Gen AI helps in this form as well to, uh, when it's strongly typed and it's well defined to further uh, extrapolate the meaning of what is being passed. Uh, and so that makes for a better recommendation when it comes back. It's not like, why, why would you make this recommendation? It doesn't make any sense. Okay. And then to put a, a, a placeholder in, in this to come back to this, this passing the inputs and the outputs and finding the data that the, the agents need to consume to do their analysis, that requires harmonized business objects, not raw data. Otherwise, they'll get lost in the data lake or uh, the operational app. Oh, 100%. And this is where we feel our data cloud really shines. And uh, we work with the data in data cloud. Uh, where the data has been brought together, harmonized, and the interconnections between different things are laid out very clearly. Um, okay, let me let me stop you there, just so that we we'll come back to that when we unpack that that layer. But I want to I want to unpack the tools first. So sure. let me bring up a, a screen that we talked about earlier, where we're going to look at uh, just a a schema of or, or a stack of the components. Now, now let's let's reiterate again. What exactly is coming out on the twenty fifth? Um, and then let's 
fit it into this stack? Yeah, what we're talking about on the 25th is a composable way to bring these agents together, right? So this uh, notion of these autonomous agents are going to be brought together uh, in an async manner as well. So we're, we're going to be talking about two things. We're going to be talking about AI-powered composability, uh, and we're also going to be talking about async API support. Um, the async API support is extremely important uh, as events themselves transpire, how are we proactively um, bringing that information to bear onto all the work that we're doing, right? So uh, it's an event-driven architecture aspect that we have to bring in. Uh, but the big news is really around this idea of AI-powered composability. Um, and really, this is this factors in a couple of the things that we've already been talking about, right? One is, how do you get to a future-ready foundation? Um, and how can you get to the kinds of efficiencies you have with the intelligent tooling? You know, we talked a little bit right at the start about developers getting, developers and builders getting, uh, uh, you know, an impetus in terms of how they're building these. And then how do you secure these AI-powered experiences? How, how do you get them in a catalog? How do you find them? You know, we talked about those disparate sets of things. Okay, right so let me pause you and let's, let's, let's unpack this piece by piece. Let's start first with a, a definition, your definition of what an agent is and what it does? Um, an agent at the very basic level acts on your behalf. Um, you're sort of, so it's a couple of things, right? Right there, you're, uh, it takes your persona, it knows what you want, it knows what you have access to and it acts on your behalf. Uh, the second thing is it doesn't need to be guided completely. It's gonna come back for guidance at certain points, but it's going to be able to go and work autonomously uh, to different levels so that it can achieve the goals that you have. Uh, it's probably the simplest uh, definition right now of what an agent would be. Um, something that is knows who you are, what you want, and can act independently on your behalf. Okay, so now let's take it the next step. When we're talking about acting on your behalf, what we've known in LLMs V1 is where they get uh, started, where they start to get more advanced is tool use. Like they can call a a code uh, editor, or they might call out to some other tool. In the context of Salesforce, they're calling out to workflow building blocks. So mm -hmm. define for us what some of those building blocks are and how they get built. In other words, what does this composable environment look like? And what is it comprised of? Uh, there's a few things. Right? One, there's a, the infrastructure one to have the catalog of these trusted things. As you create them, they, they show up in this place and you can validate what they do. Uh, the second notion is just how you create them yourself. Uh, and we span the spectrum for the different types of creators here. Uh, developers uh, with code, uh, we get into what we're doing on the AnyPoint code builder side uh, with generative uh, flows there, integration flows. Okay, uh, just to be specific, that's in the 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 uh, quadrant that's uh, on the connectors row, but under programmed, where you have any point has always had uh, API integrations, but now Einstein for any point code builder makes it easy to generate those integrations. Th there you go. And the idea here is that you're building it with natural language. You're specifying the intent of what you want. Uh, Einstein for Code Builder helps you build that uh, in code. And to be clear, these integrations are for accessing applications and potentially databases outside the Salesforce universe. In other words, this is to reach beyond Salesforce to the rest of your application estate. 100%, right? You have, there's a wide variety of things that surround your Salesforce implementation that you need access to. Like think about what we were talking about the supply chain side. Uh, there's a lot of operational data sitting in these other systems that you would need to access. And this is uh, this is the way you build those pieces to be able to get to those, uh, those bits of data. Okay, now explain how integrations get abstracted into connectors and then how connectors become actions that are part of sort of the flow palette of capabilities? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I mean, think about integration flows as specific uh, 
endpoints that you're accessing uh, data from. So they could, but then you end up having a, a set of related uh, queries that you want answers to. And typically that's what we're pulling together as a connector because the connector helps you finish the job to be done. There could be multiple tasks that you're doing, uh, but the job comprises of all of these tasks. So think of connectors at the job level and uh, the individual uh, integration flows at the at the task level. Um, so just to be clear, like a connector could be um, like a customer experience or something about procurement that has to involve, or so, maybe about supply planning that uh, spans talking to uh, different suppliers and, lo and a logistics provider. That might be a sort of supply chain planning connector, even if it, one doesn't exist yet. Yeah, I, I would say usually these, uh, these connectors are within a particular domain. Um, but there's probably a set of discrete things that you might want to do. You might, for example, you might want to ask a supplier about what they're currently sending you today. You might want then want to turn around and ask about, you know, what about these additional uh, elements themselves? Can we modify what you're sending us? And it's 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 the same. It's it's a it's a set of tasks that you're doing with the same entity that likely is going to get wrapped up into a connector. Uh, so that you have all of the related functions together and it makes sense to be able to, you know, exercise all of those conversation points, you know, with that third party. All right. And then that gets pulled together, as you were saying earlier, into our Salesforce ecosystem. We have this little bits of magic called uh, invocable actions. So uh, that's one of the ways in which we can get to all of these different systems, interpolate what is going on, uh, and then surface them back up inside Salesforce. Uh, so you can have access to all of this information. Um, and then it becomes callable from all of the other automation and integration capabilities we have directly within Salesforce as well. Okay, so let's get to that level, which um, I don't think we've covered yet, which are all the different flow types that could include Salesforce flows and Salesforce action equivalents, as well as these third-party ones, and then how an agent might on its own, figure out a plan for composing these building blocks to accomplish a task. Yeah, let's let's break those up in a, into two parts, right? Uh, let's let's first pick up uh, what's going on inside the Salesforce ecosystem. We have Salesforce Flow uh, and a different persona, really, that's sitting here. That's different from the uh, the person sitting in front of any point code builder, right? You have a Salesforce admin who is assembling flows um, using low code or no code at this point, right? They're configuring, dragging, and dropping. Uh, what we're really adding here with generative AI is the ability to go from, I would say, low code to no code, where they can specify uh, a request to create a flow just in natural language, very similar to what we were just talking about on the ACB side. Um, and you know, you'll get the same flow built out for you within Flow Builder. Uh, and there they can take advantage of several of these actions that we just talked about, right? You have all these independent agents that are functioning and now they've been made available as uh, invocable actions within the Salesforce ecosystem or within Salesforce um, Salesforce's um, uh, builders. And here these invocable actions can then be pulled into a flow directly. Um, and to be and clear, I know I'm interrupting you, but just to be clear, when it's, a Salesforce flow, those are essentially Salesforce actions or native to the Salesforce Salesforce apps, but the actions built on connectors are how you span to other applications. Yeah, I'll just get our terminology right. Actions tends to be a really overused word, at least in our Salesforce ecosystem. So actions are very specific things that help you reach out and do one thing or two things. They're their actions, right? They 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 have a definite begin and an end. Uh, and what we were talking about, all these different agents being made available once they come in as invocable actions, become that set of things. That's the tentacles that lets you hit whatever the, the specific things that you want. Flows themselves tend to be a sequence of um, act actions, a sequence of steps that can include actions within them as well. And yes. so, if you're okay. trying to pull information from different parts of Salesforce, you want to get user input from somebody else, depending on, we have various types of flows within uh, Salesforce and 
actions can be interspersed within those uh, sequence of steps. And also, just to be clear as to where the current state of the technology is today, um, when you build um, an integration or a connector, it's uh, uh, up to the developer to build in the transaction semantics, like how to talk to the external system, how to handle errors or retries, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. It tends to be more atomic within that. And you know what needs to happen and what's a good outcome and what's not. And then there's always fallback things that uh, in, in error conditions that you can take care of so that the transaction actually goes through successfully. Okay. So um, now let's let's talk about the, the, um, the data estate. We've touched on this before, but like if we're dealing with a raw data lake, agents and people would have trouble navigating it and applications would have trouble um, essentially making sense of the business objects and communicating between agents or, or flows. So explain the role of the customer 360 data model in making it easier to reason about actions that deal with customer data and then how would customers uh, now i'm using the word your enterprise customers how they might bring in additional data and harmonize that so that they can reason not just over the customer data but maybe the supply chain data or other things yeah for sure um, and i think just to set up the background on this you, you got to start with the salesforce data model itself, right? Even before we think about our uh, customer 360 uh, pieces in data cloud, uh, there's, a, there's a very robust data model. This is what all our users love about Salesforce. It helps them express uh, a number of things just directly in the uh, standard objects that we provide. And they can also then write custom objects as well. That's really specific to them. Now, I think the, the bit that we're doing with data cloud and the customer 360 is just taken that to a whole entire level. Uh, and we've seen this in the last couple of years as this, you know, as customers have started using it. And really what makes it so powerful is connecting the connecting these ideas beyond what is just inside the Salesforce uh, database itself. Um, and that's where when we see interactions happening in external systems, uh, that have a bearing on on the on the user or the or the customer within Salesforce. We want to know about that, and we want all of your intelligent applications to know about that and take advantage of that. Uh, it's that additional information that's happening off stage from Salesforce that we want to bring in, um, and and it has to be harmonized. It's not it's not brought in, and uh, you still have to know what that those interactions mean. I mean, a very simple example is. Uh, just users, right? Users inside Salesforce might have different IDs when they're doing things in other systems as well. So how do you actually harmonize and know that it's the same person? Uh, that's one really simple form of harmonization, I would say. And the minute you can, you know that it's the same person and you look at a set of interactions that have happened in an external system and you overlay that with what you have inside Salesforce, you have a much fuller picture of what has actually happened or what this poor customer has been through maybe in previous service requests or other purchases they may have made. Uh, and you can now really have a better understanding of what their intent is and what would be a good outcome for that. Um, and so at that point, that's our data graph uh, and that's our normalization aspects. And now we, we can take advantage of that with these agents as well, right? To know what is fully transpired so the recommendations and the uh, and the choices that the agents are making are more in line with what this user would want. So would it be fair to say that by by taking the data model out of the Salesforce operational apps, and um, I don't know if I've got the term terminology quite right, but if there was a there's like an enterprise graph and a data graph, um, the, if I understand it, the data graph is the the data model for a particular customer um, that then that's the scaffolding on which in the data cloud, you add additional um, and ad additional elements to the data model related to engagement. So this is where you, you get the rest of the customer 360 
like even if it's from external systems. And the, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is by leveraging the data model from Salesforce and then adding some additional customer experience related data model, then all the data engineering that requires so much heavy lifting in the form of code heavy pipelines today becomes a point and click configuration driven process. And so then it's much easier to bring in just the incremental stuff that adds to that data model. Then you become gravity that attracts the additional stuff. Uh, I would agree with that. It's the, 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 the point of it, I would say it's the customer is the customer at the end, right? Like there's, there's nothing that's really different. It's just that within Salesforce, we have a view of that and there's a lot more that's happening with them. Really all we're trying to do in the customer 360 is that you get the fullest extent and the fullest view of that customer as possible. So you're right. Uh, some of this is taking the entities that we have, supplementing the information that we can get from other systems, and importantly, uh, harmonizing that over what we already know. Right, And so uh, the, the data graph gives you the full picture of, uh, of what has happened. And you know, the minute we get some other engagement data from you know, a different system, that overlays it and each bit actually adds another layer. It's a fabric. It adds another another layer to the fabric uh, that gives you a better uh, and fuller picture of what has happened with that customer. So I know we're, we're, we're now in the foundational you know, data layer, but to be clear, as you're adding that additional data, um, the 360 data model can evolve without breaking the um, no code, low code tools that help populate it. Yeah, and that's one of the features that we have. You know, one of the most popular ways that people interact with data cloud today that that use Salesforce Flow is with what we call the data cloud triggered flow. And so, um, if you've written triggered flows at all before, a change in the Salesforce database, you there's a change in a in the lead, and it you know something changes there, and you want the salesperson to take some action on it, you would write a a, a, a triggered flow. We wanted exactly the same interaction model to be available to uh, you know an admin if there was a change in data cloud data. Uh, why would we not, right? I mean, we've we've got people really knowing how to be able to make change, you know, act on these changes in the Salesforce data. You can do exactly the same thing on data cloud uh, data that's changing as well. Uh, and you can write yourself a data cloud triggered flow, and you can make whatever actions that uh, that are appropriate when something in data cloud has changed. And of course, the purview and footprint of what is in data cloud is much larger than what we would have in the traditional Salesforce data model. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, we've been talking about okay the foundation that enables agents to have workflows as, as tools that it figures out how to combine and compose to accomplish a task. Um, and data cloud as the, um, not only the contextual data foundation, but the harmonized modeled foundation so that it understands the semantics of the data. Now, we need to get to um, the level, we, we've basically been talking about one or a small number of agents um, accomplishing uh, a workflow or a sequence of tasks. So now let's get to the point of how do you align individual agents with, with larger corporate objectives or constraints and, and how you might improve the efficiency of the entire system of agents and processes. And this takes us to the analytics um, layer, which I think we've put so far, at least on this slide, on um, process management and, and observability. So, and I, I don't know if this is the, the quite right layer to put it in, but where we have to look across really not just the behavior um, of, the, uh, of the data, but of the agents themselves. So maybe explain, explain how you can align the goals and the constraints of individual agents and their workflows with the overall goals and objectives that you might set for a larger organization or an entire enterprise, and maybe get, do do that with an example. Uh, yeah, no. I, one of the really interesting things is uh, 
the efficiency in which work gets done, whether it's with people or whether with, it's with agents. You know, I really think about them as uh, processes with people, systems, and bots. And, and really, we've got all of those uh, functioning here. Uh, one way to look at the overall effectiveness of, of a particular process, um, we gather the analytical information about the execution of these things, right? The auditability, the trace logs, all of that. We have all of that information. Um, we have the information that's in the customer 360 about what the customer has done as well, uh, and the data graphs that are inside data cloud. Process mining becomes a really interesting way for us then to look at um, what, how are these things transpiring and what is the most efficient way in which these elements can be brought together. Uh, we haven't said much about that top layer where you, you know what we're calling orchestration, uh, but really that it's a lot of these end-to-end -end experiences start with defining what an orchestration should look like. And then that's when these people systems and bots are actually working together. We now have the analytical information coming out of that system. Uh, and then process mining lets us go back and see how closely were we aligned to, to what we had initially set out. Right, like what what is happening with our overall orchestration? Are we actually hitting the the goals and the the targets that we had? Uh, both in terms of you know how, it could be something like a quality of service. Are we providing the right quality of service? And are we hitting the SLAs that we want? Uh, if not, why? Right, and then process mining lets us get into it and understand what is standing in the way of that and what should be changed in the overall orchestration. So I think that's one of the ways in which you can sort of round trip and look at, uh, are you actually meeting the objectives that you had set out when you, uh, when you designed the system to be how it is? Okay, so, so in other words, just conceptually, you might think of actually process mining above the orchestration layer, because that's the global system intelligence. And that would inform how to improve orchestration in the form of how you're sequencing um, or even how you're designing individual agents in the future. Is that a fair way to recap it? Yeah, hundred percent. I kind of almost see like something going from analytics as a full loop back into orchestration. And, you know, I would sort of put process mining on that, right? And that becomes your full loop. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, we're doing this all the time. Customers are doing this all the time uh, to ensure that they're staying ahead. This is what, you know, classically you would call this process improvement. Uh, and now we have a very, you know, um, precise way to come at it, and with the with, you know, a very data-oriented way to come at it to make those uh, to make those improvements. Yeah, you told me uh, so far. There's a there's a um, an integration with um, um, an analytics form, Apromore. Apromore is a business partner we have uh, with the tools to do the process mining for us. Um, we look at the data exhaust that comes out of our execution logs. Uh, it gets auto tagged to come into Apromore. Uh, and then Apromore is, uh, is able to come back through, help us find the places where we've got the process blockers, uh, understand what those blockers are, what, what's causing it, right? Is it, is it not, we don't have enough, I don't know, approvers on a particular step in the process or uh, or something else, right? We can really decipher if it's a resource constraint uh, or if the process just needs to be redesigned. It could be that uh, a particular, particularly uh, expensive resource is, is being unnecessarily used, or there could be some additional steps to streamline that. Uh, and it comes back with proposals on how it, the, the problem could be solved. The cool thing after that is we can run some simulations on it using the data that we have to say, hey, ha had we made this change, what 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 would it have looked like? And so then you can you can have uh, a lot more confidence that the the proposed change that you're going to make is actually going to work. Uh, and then of course you're also constantly tracking it um, in once it goes live to make sure that that's uh, that's what's happening. Or if something else is actually starting to become the the the, the root cause of the problem. Okay, so let me try and now step a little bit into the future mm -hmm. and let's talk about what this might look like and you tell me how far out this might be. Now imagine like that these flows that are being composed by the agents include models 
that themselves um, are prescribing a certain uh, type of action. Um, this is it's almost like there's a um, a planning step within within the flows, and and I'm 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 sort of putting this together on the fly here, but the idea that because this is Salesforce, these models can be connected to business outcomes in the Salesforce operational apps and potentially even through the integrations and connectors via, via actions to outcomes in external apps. Mm -hmm. And that that feedback can improve the individual models in particular workflows. And then as you have a composite of agent flows, um, multiple agent flows working together that you're orchestrating and then process mining, you start to you start to be setting up a flywheel where you're learning at the individual task level and you're learning at the larger process level. And so then you've got this flywheel where your your goal as a manager is to orchestrate like architect and orchestrate and optimize this overall system. And it's not it's not autonomous, but it's embodying, like when, when we talk about managers building processes in the past that meant designing organizational processes, now you're embodying more of those processes into software artifacts. Help me flesh out that vision and what that might look like and how far out it is. Um, it, it's, it, it's not as far out as we think it is. I, I think that's what's become really clear in the last 12 months or so. Um, I think a lot of it in terms of the technology is probably here. We have all of the elements in place. It's about sequencing them uh, as we're exploring and taking the next steps. The biggest thing in my view here is how do you keep the humans in the loop as you go ahead and do this, right? How do you take how can you be autonomous and take guidance at the right moments? Um, it's almost like you know when you hire a new employee, right? Some of them are just fabulous in, in that they'll go out and figure out what they have to do and they'll come back exactly at the time when they need to take input. Uh, and you want them to be proactive like that, but not also go off of the deep end, right? I, th I see this as exactly something similar to that. We can sequence a number of these things, put them into place, and then we need to be able to have the right checkpoints to know that it's moving in the right direction. And I think that's one of the one of the things I'm personally really interested in, right? Like this uh, this human agent interface and this human agent evolution, because it's not going to be the human by themselves. Uh, it hasn't been for a long time, right? So that's not particularly revolutionary, but this this close interaction that you're going to have with the agents that you're working on and then the overall outcomes that you're getting to. I think that the, the combination of those things is going to be really interesting. Okay. So there's actually two things here. You brought up something that I left out, which is it's not just the analytic models that are learning from the outcomes. It's the plans that the agents generate that the human um, manager supervises and might tweak or improve so that the next iteration of the plan is either more reliable or more efficient or more aligned after the analytics with the overall objective. So there's, there's two levels of improvement. The analytic artifacts are collecting you know, feedback from uh, uh, sort of business outcomes maybe related to the, the operational apps, but then there's also improvement going on in the in the planning of each individual agent is that a fair way to characterize it oh yeah i think so i, I think it's definitely happening at both levels um if you think about you know individually am i getting and it, the, the level of feedback could vary right like did 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 the logistic agent come back with three viable plans or was like one just ridiculous and i would i would give it feedback saying look these two make sense and this one doesn't right so uh, the, the feedback doesn't have to be necessarily super detailed. It could just be, uh, it's kind of like marking spam in your in, in your inbox. Right? You're saying, okay, this looks like spam, that doesn't. That's very black and white. 
here you're getting into a little bit more nuanced area about, you know, was this useful to you or was this not? And I think some of this is how do you take that kind of input uh, and get better at generating the the things that are useful to you? I, I, I think that this this idea of going qualitatively, understanding the usefulness or applicability of the recommendation, I think is going to be one of the uh, one of the ways in which you're defining success and that you're that you're getting better at uh, at being able to quantify these more abstract notions. So well, let, let's touch on this, and this may be again futures, but these the the recommendation that let's say an agent comes back with um, is the result of its execution of a plan. Now, let's say there's some user experience that that still has to be designed or that's in the process of being designed for how a user now interacts with an agent to essentially grade or refine its plan or its recommendation. The, the plan that got it to the recommendation or the recommendation itself is essentially it's an evaluation function for the agent. And then um, how that might be incorporated so that that improves the agent's planning reliability and, and efficiency in the future. Might, might there be some admin task that collects the successfully evaluated plans or the positively evaluated plans then maybe generate synthetic examples, multiple synthetic examples of those, and then does a fine tuning task that maybe updates an adapter on in, in the model associated with the agent's planning engine. I, I'll tell you, we, we, we're grappling with that right today, right? When we're talking about creation, we talked about um, Einstein for AnyPoint Code Builder and Einstein for Flow. Think about what's happening there, right? Like I, the, it's an agent, it's building something for me. Uh, I've asked it to get the inventory data from SAP and merge it with what's in uh, Salesforce, right? And I, I want a flow for that. It's generated something for me. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to give it feedback and say, yeah, that did the job for me. Or if it's close enough, I'm going to make a couple of changes to it, right? Like, and, and all of that is a learning opportunity right there. One is direct feedback. This worked. It didn't work. The next bit is more nuanced feedback. 70% was good, I'm gonna make the next little bit of the change and then I'm gonna use it. I think just the fact that I made changes and then used it is actually another piece of training information as well right there, right? So to some extent, we're all of that future stuff, we're seeing some of those elements right now. It's just only going to get more refined and more um, every interaction that you have with that agent uh, in evaluating its output is going to become valuable information to make it generate something more useful for you. Okay, so this is critical because right now there's a whole lot of discussion about the difficulty of evaluating models, especially the, the generative models. Um, and part of that difficulty is it's a lot of general purpose benchmarks, whereas we're talking here about use case specific evaluation. And unlike traditional software validation, this is not about QA. This feeds directly back into the fine tuning to make the next iteration of generated plans, again, more reliable or, or efficient. And I assume you've got some sort of loop where ev evaluation isn't about grading the model. It's about grading the plan to improve the model. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, 100%. I, I, I think you're still grounded in a domain. And so because you're in the domain, you have some qualitative assessment of how good the, the returned information or the return generated artifact is to you. So I think, and, and that can be either a discrete yes, no, and it can, or it can be a more analogous, you know, yeah, pretty good, close, but not quite, here's the difference. Uh, and, and capturing that and then funneling it back, doing the, doing the full loop through, uh, is is what's going to make this even more effective, uh, and I'll, I'll say like the more specific the domain is, the the better you're going to get at getting to the answer that you want. I think the the wider it is, it becomes much more uh, much more complicated. So, uh, scoping it down to like you know something like inventory or you know a, a very specific task, uh, your your chances of success here are going to go up uh, much more quickly. Okay, so you're actually identifying additional things that I didn't say up in the beginning about why enterprise agents 
are a more tractable problem than open-ended open world agents, which is it's it's not just that you have the state of the business and the semantics um, or business the, the state of the business in the form of harmonized data objects that are that are stateful and evolving with the business process, but that you have an evaluation function for each of these agent flows that is domain specific and therefore has a, a rich signal for feedback. Uh, yeah, 100%. I, I think it comes down to expectation, right? There's an expectation in a particular domain of a certain uh, outcome. And the and there's also this the level of preciseness that is needed. I would say certain things require a high level of precision and some other things less so. And then the, the human is happy to fill in some of the gaps. So I think you got to understand that domain and you got to understand the variance that is that you can tolerate. And uh, and again, at the end, it's the usefulness, right? Ha have I, uh, maybe I haven't solved it 100% as an agent, but how close did I come? And how can I, you know, how can I get, how can I become better at solving uh, the need that's there? But it comes from that nuance of the expectation, being able to understand the expectation and then being able to close the gap on it. Okay, this is, this is we've covered a lot. Um, any parting thoughts on what we should be on on what our expectations should be when we look out a year or two about what capabilities might look like then? I think it's a really exciting time to be in this space right now. I think everything from creator productivity, the way we are creating these agents, um, and in the ways in which these agents are going to get used in the in the end, uh, you know, in the end outcome. I think it, it's going to change uh, a lot of professions really, really fast. I think the important thing is that these tools are provided like inbound and in the in the places where people go to do this work today. So if you have integration and automation tools, we want to make them available right there. Uh, and especially in those places where it's not completely discrete, uh, you know, right? Like the place where the person can, the human can do the last mile part I think that's where the productivity is going to come from. I think this is all about human productivity at the end, uh, and then having these tools just directly in uh, available where these people work is going to make a huge difference. And for us at MuleSoft and in Salesforce, that's the game we're in. Right? Like we want to help people be more successful at what they do, uh, and this technology will help us get there. And I think the next eighteen months is going to be a pretty exciting time. So building on inferring from what I'm hearing you say, uh, perhaps over the next 18 months, we won't just see better tools for customers to build their own agents, but we'll see more and more agents built in to Salesforce to accomplish tasks that used to be surfaced through the user interface. Uh, 100%. We have a Salesforce co-pilot, and we're all in on making it really, really good and expanding all of the things you can do within the co-pilot, right? All of, we talked about invocable actions earlier. Uh, a number of the things that we have here are all going to be available. Today, invocable actions are available in Salesforce co-pilot. Uh, I just think that the, the quality and the reach and the kinds of things that you can do with these agents is just going to get uh, so much more powerful. It's all going to come to you within the Salesforce Copilot interface. Okay, BJ, that was a, a wonderful tour of what's coming, and more than just it was more than just about Salesforce because we can generalize that to understand agents in the enterprise. And so, with that, let's call it a wrap for today. And of course, we'll have to have you back to give us an update on the progress and and what the future looks like when we when we um, look um, look out in a few months. So uh, thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I'd love to be back. Uh, lots of new things out there and can't wait for customers to get their hands on it and uh, make progress in their business. Okay, thanks, Vijay. Thank you, George.